So, I mean, we have been spending a fair amount of time. I mean, this is the second, seventh week of the course, right? So we're halfway through. Um, and the first half of the course was, um, a, you know, a handful of sessions on some foundational materials, which, thinking back, what, what did we cover those first few sessions? <laughs> I know it's been several weeks ago. Uh, so deep time, right? And uh, relative age dating, absolute age dating, you know, to give you that, that deep time perspective that you need to bring to geology. And then what was the other major theoretical framework that we introduced to kick off the course? A little bit more specific. There's the, you know, what is the the geological equivalent of evolution by natural selection for biology? The organizing principle that helps us to explain why the continents are where they are and where we're finding why we're finding plate tectonics. So we talked a little bit about the history of plate tectonics. Then we spent like what four and a half weeks at least talking about Earth materials, rock cycle, minerals, rock cycle, igneous sedimentary, metamorphic rocks, because that's the, um, you know, as I, as I wrote it up, you know, if, if geology is talking about the story of the earth, the earth, earth materials are the, are the words that, that make up that story. So now we're going to be, that looks funny, now we're going to be switching into more of the earth processes. And uh, we're going to basically start uh, from inside out. We're going to look at um, several sessions on things that are taking place inside the Earth. Then we'll get back to plate tectonics in a more formal way, rather than just a, a historical development of the idea way, to talk about you know, what are actually some of the real uh, specific processes involved in moving these continental plates around. What does that mean for earthquakes, for deformations, and so forth? And then we'll we'll round out the class by looking at a more surp surface or surficial geology. Um, so, actually, uh, want to start off with a little activity. So, uh, let me. Um, I'm going, to hand out, I'm going to hand you out a sheet where I want each of you individually, first of all, to draw your conception of the interior of the earth. So the, the prompt here is if you could take a giant knife and cut the earth in half and you know, look at the cut half of the earth, what would you see? And I want you to diagram that and, you know, and write about it and be as complete as possible. So let me get that out. Okay, so how was, I mean, how did everyone's compare? What were some of the things that you all had down on your conceptual models of the Earth? Let's see, okay, let me draw an Earth here. So what are you going to see? Layers. Layers, okay. So should I just start drawing layers? <coughs> what layers? Okay. The layer on the okay. So you want me to tell draw a little teeny tiny layer? Yeah. So we got a crust. Okay. Uh, mantle. Teeny tiny mantle. Um, it's like the biggest one. What? Certainly the biggest one in terms of volume. <coughs> and that may be. Something like that. Lumpy, <laughs> a, a lumpy boundary there. And then what else? 
So here we got mantle. Here we got crust. Outer and inner core. I assume the outer core is on the outside and the inner core is on the inside. Quite a good question, lithosphere. We'll, we'll, we'll see that. Okay. I mean, is this basically what people did? Okay. Convection currents where? Okay. Does anybody else have anything else on their diagram? What, Britain? Well, the lithosphere, if we're going to jump ahead a little bit, is the crust plus a little bit of the mantle. So it's not, it's more complicated than just crust, mantle, outer core, inner core, right? So we've got lithosphere, we've got xenosphere, we've got some other things going on here. Uh, anything else? Okay. Well, I mean, the reason for starting off this way, other than just to make sure you're all awake, uh, is I was uh, reading this kind of interesting study. Uh, there's a lot of, of research on geoscience education, which obviously it's not the topic of the course here, but I thought this study was interesting. They uh, went and interviewed essentially 90-ish uh, undergraduate students that were taking an introductory earth sciences course. Uh, not all geology majors, but there were, would have been some. You know, this is a course that education majors take as well. I'm sure, it's a course that other people were in just because it was a nat natural sciences gen ed at the at the particular campus. And so they sat down with each individual student uh, for like an hour-long interview, which is something I'm not going to do with a 10 view because I don't have 10 hours. And, uh, but, uh, you know, they asked basically this, this initial prompting question, had students draw, ask follow-up questions, and they kind of characterized the um, uh, responses into these different levels. So... Um, how would you characterize what's going on with this level here? <coughs> this level one, this level A. Well, it's just the right? What? Yeah, basically. So, um, yeah. so clearly, you know, the students who are drawing. Earth like this have some misconceptions about the Earth that they need, will need to unlearn before they can actually learn. Um, then we've got you know this kind of uh, level versus this. There, uh, you know, they're both kind of scientifically accurate. Here we've got basically kind of a real basic uh, description which is possibly comparable to many of your drawings. Uh, a little bit more uh, detailed information here. Um, and then, although this diagram doesn't necessarily look uh, more sophisticated, this stage was characterized by not only focusing on the structures in terms of the layering, but also um, some of the processes, okay. so you know what what's being displayed here, Grace. Convection, okay. Yeah, we've got a solid inner core, which I'm not sure we mentioned when we were talking about your all of your drawings. Now, what uh, this is, freshman? No, this is undergrads uh, taking an intro earth sciences course. You know what? Got any guessing about? you know, where most people are in terms of their conceptual models that they brought to the course? Yeah, probably mostly B or C. 
So yeah, about 70% of the students were in B or C. Almost a quarter, though, had uh, some severe misconceptions about you know what the interior of the Earth was like, and very few, uh, like 10%, um, added kind of process elements to their depiction of their of their conceptual models. So, you know, at 8.30 in the morning or 9 o'clock in the morning, um, most of you guys are, are in here somewhere. So, I mean, many of us, most of us have this kind of picture in mind when we're talking about um, looking at the inside of the earth. You probably have seen many, many pictures like this um, over the course of your young lives so far. Uh, but the question I want to focus on today is, how do we know this? So, let me throw that out, not as a rhetorical question right now. You're all accepting this mostly as your conceptual model of the inside of the Earth. How do we know? It's conjecture. Okay, is it conjecture? Harkening back to plate tectonics theory, because uh, we were postulating that uh, these continental plates are floating around and oceanic plates, these crustal plates are floating around, therefore the processes in the mantle are driving them. Now yeah, he's talking about uh, the way earthquakes propagate through. Um, How else might we know what's going on inside the Earth? We go down a volcano in Iceland and uh, sail a raft across the center of the Earth, like in Jules Verne. Yep, and then you fight dinosaurs. And then you fight dinosaurs. Um, okay, so let's let's uh, unpack this a little bit for the time we've got to do today. Um, obviously, one way would be what can we directly observe. So, number one, um, we make as many direct observations as we can, and that's a source of data that we can then use to um, figure out what's going on. Okay. So, how far down do you think that we have drilled into the Earth? Uh, at least shaking your head, not that far. What does not that far mean? What? Not past the crust. Okay. So, yeah, the take home message we've not drilled into the mantle. We have no way, therefore, to have directly, a directly access the mantle. Therefore, we can't collect mantle material per directly and bring it into the lab and take a look at it. Uh, yeah, clearly we've not, we've only drill, drilled down into the crust. Um, and the deepest drilling we've done is the Kola Super Deep Borehole that was done by the Soviet Union slash Russian Federation. Um, and they got down 12 kilometers, okay. like eight miles. Okay. So um, that's clearly um, a massive effort, even to get down that far. And um, as was mentioned, we're still basically in the crust. 
So I've got a couple of, of web videos I want to pull up at this point. So I'm going to stop the recording here, switch over to the browser. Um, but I just will mention, well, let me, let's just go ahead and play them. So getting back, uh, leaving the conspiracy theory stuff aside and getting back to the actual you know, science we get out of this. Again, we're talking about going down 12 kilometers, but how far? Uh, we're talking about, obviously, continental crust in this area. So what proportion of the continental crust do we get down through in, the Baltic, in this Baltic crust here? Not down to the center of the earth, but just through the crust itself. The 12 kilometers is about mm, more like a third. Okay. So the crust is going to be about 35 kilometers deep in this area. So, I don't know, 20 plus years of drilling and uh, we're only a third of the way down through the crust. And um, again, the, um, I mean, there were obviously interesting geological samples that they took at the different levels. You see a change in composition of the rocks as you're going down there. Um, the water was unexpected, uh, not a holdover from the biblical flood though, uh, squeezed out of the rocks by geological processes. Um, and the temperature increased more rapidly than they expected. And they got down to basically to a layer of rocks where um, they just couldn't drill effectively because the rocks were too so plastic that you really the drill bit really couldn't is like drilling in putty. Um, in fact, much of the 12 kilometers, the drilling went fairly quickly, and I think it probably took them four or five years drilling off and on to get that last half a kilometer that they were able to eke out. And then at some point, you know, this is just not worth the effort. We're not getting down any further. That's the deepest. Um, yeah, and go check out uh, other videos you find if you want uh, something amusing to do on a Friday. Uh, there are other deep areas that are uh, <coughs> commercially, you know, done for commercial reasons, gold mining uh, in particular, but also some of the diamond mines are fairly deep, but the gold mine in particular uh, in South Africa are um, some of the deepest on active ongoing um, drill sites. And uh, this has been an interesting place from an astrobiological perspective as well, because um, Researchers who are interested in the ability of organisms to live under extreme environments on other planets will make their way down, you know, make arrangements to be able to go down into some of these deep mines. And they're, they collect not only various kinds of microbial communities, but even things like uh, nematode worms and so forth uh, are still functioning at depth. So there's obviously the ability to support very deep uh, ecosystems biological communities, probably, I mean, clearly not driven by photosynthesis. Um, four kilometers down into solid rock. There are, are, are different kinds of microbial species that can live off of hydrogen that's being um, given off by rocks like granite as they uh, decompose, as they, uh, you know, chemically weather at, at depth. And that reduced hydrogen can be the source of nourishment for, for microbes that are growing on it. And then, of course, if you've got microbes that are growing on something, then there are going to be other microbes that can eat them, and they can form the basis for, uh, you know, a food chain that is uh, divorced from photosynthesis and is more driven by chemosynthetic uh, um, producers. There's been a lot of emphasis on drilling the ocean crust. You would think that that would be more difficult to drill uh, the ocean crust than on land, 
why, what would be the interest in drilling through the crust in the ocean as opposed to continental crust? It's already deeper. Well, it's already deeper, but um, that just means you have to start drilling further down, right? But I think you're kind of on the right track. What is different about the oceanic crust compared to continental crust that would make it useful to try to drill deep samples there? It's thinner. It is thinner. Okay. So continental crust is thicker. Um, and so, I mean, if you were able to drill 12 kilometers down in certain areas of oceanic crust, like they did at the continental crust there in the Baltics, you actually might be able to break through the crust into the mantle. Might have to go a little bit further, but uh, I mean, you, you don't have to go 35, 40 kilometers down through oceanic crust because it is thinner than the continental crust but it's more difficult to drill. And uh, yeah, as we talked about a little bit with the plate tectonics material earlier, the, the oceanic crust is mostly going to be basaltic lava flow. And so that's the kind of materials that, uh, that they come up with for the drilling here. Just throwing a couple of pictures here, we don't necessarily have to go down to the mantle to get samples of mantle material. The earth itself brings modified mantle material up to the surface in a couple of different ways. One is just through um, uh, uplift of more really deep crustal material rather than mantle material itself. But uh, also uh, volcanoes can sometimes bring up uh, samples of materials from deep that have not been molten, uh, melted. So as the magma is coming up through the upper layers of the mantle, it can pull off pieces of country rock that it's going through. And if that magma rises up quickly enough and erupts, you can get pieces of uh, like this uh, protodyte um, that is thought to be a fairly good representation of what's, uh, what the mantle, upper mantle material might actually be like. Uh, we've been talking about metamorphic material and we get those materials metamorphizing in terms of regional metamorphism at the base of, of massive mountain chains. And so some of these metamorphic rocks may have been processed, you know, 15, 18 kilometers down. And then eventually through uplift and erosion of material off of the top, they can be exposed. And so we can use those as well. But I think the main point we want to make here in terms of the use of direct observation to understand what's going on in the Earth I mean, what would you say about it? How much direct observation have we done of the interior of the Earth? Teeny, 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 tiny. And it's unlikely that we're going to be able to do much uh, in the future. We're not going to be drilling down to the outer core anytime soon. So, um, you know, if you put the cola deep borehole on this diagram here, as thin as the crust is, and that crust that is displayed is not really uh, proportional either. If this were drawn really to scale, the crust would be a very, very tiny skin on the outside of this figure and the borehole, that deepest borehole, would only go like a third of the way through it. Okay, so number two is what can we say about the inside, inside of the earth just based on the density of the earth? So if you... Um, uh, 
Um, I mean, you can tell just by picking up a piece of talc versus a piece of galena, just by the difference in density that, you know, they're going to be different kinds of materials, right? So the density, if we can figure out the density of the Earth, uh, that might tell us something about how the Earth is structured inside. I mean, if the Earth was all cotton candy inside, the density would be pretty low. If uh, the Earth was all lead inside, the density would be substantially higher. Um, so density, obviously, is just mass versus uh, volume. How do we figure out the volume of the Earth? What, Grace? It right says right there. Okay, so the volume is uh, the volume of a sphere. The Earth is mostly a sphere. It's a little bit oblate. It's a little bit flattened at the poles, but we can treat it as a sphere. And so, what what do you need to know? What measurement do you need to know about a sphere in order to be able to calculate its volume? You need to know the radius. So. Uh, when in our history would we have been able to come up with an idea of what the radius of the Earth was? Oh, rather than those times. I mean, we have to we have to have a culture that thinks of the Earth as a sphere, you know, and uh, actually the. Um, The ancient Greeks were able to, some of them were able to come up with a fairly good idea of the size of the earth by um, measuring the uh, shadow at noon in a couple of different places. I think one of the, one, someone was observing in Alexandria and someone was observing north of the equator. And um, they were able to come up with a fairly good uh, idea of, of what the radius of the Earth was. So the, the volume is um, something that could be done fairly easily once we have a conception of a round Earth. How do you weigh the Earth? Hard to put it on a scale. That really did wait until anybody recognized this guy. What? Isaac Newton. Very brilliant, but very weird guy. Um, and it was Newton's universal law of gravitation that uh, described how uh, gravitational attraction between two masses is proportional to the, the masses and the distances involved. And it's by those kinds of um, analyses that we can basically weigh the Earth, we can weigh the Moon, you know, by, by um, calculating the Newtonian dynamics, uh, mechanics of the Moon orbiting around the Earth. Uh, we can, you know, weigh both the Earth and the Moon. We have a lot of experience sending satellites around, around the Earth, around the Moon. Um, you know, um, we can uh, we can even weigh things like Pluto out in the Kuiper Belt because Pluto has a Moon that's uh, orbiting around it. And you know, once we've got those two bodies orbiting each other, we can come up with weights. So we get absurd figures like six times 10 to the 24th kilograms, one times 10 to the 10th square uh, cubic kilometers. And so the overall average density of the Earth is a close to five and a half grams per cubic centimeter. So what does that mean to any of you? A lot of heavy metal in it. 
Okay, um, anybody know what the density of water is? One, okay. It's defined to be, I mean, the units, the metric units are defined in such a way that uh, one cubic centimeter of water weighs one gram. Okay. So the Earth on average is about five and a half times as dense as water. Um, cork, obviously, is less dense than water because it floats. Most of the minerals we're familiar with, most of the rocks we're familiar with, are denser than water because they don't float. Um, and so the thing to do would be well, now that we know what this overall density of the Earth is, let's compare it to various kinds of minerals and rocks that we're familiar with. And maybe that will give us an idea of what's going on inside the Earth. So we're looking here. Uh, this histogram just shows uh, the distribution of densities or specific gravities for different kinds of minerals and mineral classes. Uh, so some of the minerals we're familiar with, you know, quartz, olivine, um, Quartz is more felsic, right? Olivine is what we expect to find in more mafic rocks. We expect to find high levels of quartz in more felsic rocks. And um, as you might expect, the olivine has a higher density than the quartz. Um, we've got a couple of salts here. I mean, all of these... How do these, how do all of these that I'm circling compare to the density of the Earth overall? They're lower. Okay. So these kinds of things are what we're familiar with in the crust. And occasionally we get some of these things. But most of the crust is going to be various kinds of silicate minerals. So the crust is overall lighter lower density than the Earth overall. What do you infer then about the deeper layers of the Earth? They have to be denser to, to, counter out, to counterbalance it so that it averages out to that five and a half grams per cubic centimeter. So just by beginning to look at the overall density of the Earth and the density of materials we're familiar with, we're beginning to make some uh, inferences about what structure we might expect on the inside of the earth. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but um, if you look at the uh, moment of inertia for a spinning body, whether that body is uniform or differentiated into different layers inside will influence how that body spins around. And again, I'm not going to go into the details, but given the way that the Earth processes around its axis and the degree it wobbles while it's doing that, that also is an indication that there are differentiated layers inside the Earth. Layers of different density as you go from the surface to the inner core. Because if the Earth was uniform all the way through, it would wobble in a different way than it actually does. Wouldn't have a well, that's a whole other question. Uh, where's the magnetosphere coming from? Um, actually, you could have a body that was uniform. Let's say the inside of the Earth was all uh, molten outer core. The outer core was the whole inside of the Earth. As long as we had conductive material moving in currents in, in, those, in that material, it would generate a magnetic field. Okay. But it's hard to get that without differentiation into the different layers. It may be even impossible to get that without the differentiation in the different layers. So that construction of this density model of the Earth gives us an idea that we've got layers with different densities um, as we go in. And it would make sense for the densest material to be at the center of the Earth because why?
just since the Earth is in 90 degrees on its axis, that weight in the center would kind of keep, keep it pulling? Yeah, you're, you're, you're being too complicated here. If I had, if I had a glass with three liquids with it that had different densities, where would the densest liquid go in the glass? To the bottom. Because gravity. Right? So if we've got denser material and lighter material, as planets differentiate, the denser material is going to tend to sink down to the bottom because it's going to be pulled there by gravity. The lighter material is going to be more likely to float. And so just on that basis alone, we would expect densities to get higher as you go down and to the center of the Earth. And the, um, the overall density measurements indicate that the crust is less dense than the Earth uh, average overall. That fits with that. The Earth wobbles in such a way that that indicates that there are these differentiated layers. So it's all building together to this idea that you all have in mind when you talk about drawing the cross section of the Earth of these different layers. It is uh, how can we put any constraints on that? And we can put some constraints on that just based on densities. So if we, ex if we just say, okay, we've got a core that is metal, and we've got mantle that is some non-metallic material, and we've got crust that is lighter on top, well, what would be the overall density of the Earth if that core were, you know, 5,000 kilometers in radius? Well, if we had a core that was 5,000 kilometers in radius, and we took that amount of volume and multiplied it by the density of iron ore, we would get an Earth that would weigh too much. So just by that kind of logic alone, we can say, well, um, we can't go down and sample the top and the bottom of the mantle, but the, the mantle's got to be somewhere, um, the, the difference between the core and the mantle has to be somewhere in here because if the mantle extended down this far, the Earth would be too light. If the core extended up this high, the Earth would be heavier than we, than we measure. And therefore, we know that that boundary between the core and the mantle is going to be in this range. I'm kind of glossing over and making it uh, you know, kind of a, a generic analysis, but that, um, just that logic by itself allows us to constrain how big the core can be, how thick the mantle can be. Because if, if we let the core get too big, it's going to throw off the overall mass measurements that we've made of the Earth. If we make the core too small, it's going to throw the measurement off in the other direction. And so uh, for other planets, and moons in our inner solar system. This is basically the level of the analysis that we can, can, um, can do because we don't have the seismic stations on these other worlds that uh, we've got on the Earth. So there's been a lot of questions, uh, for example, on Mars to ask, you know, um, how, what's its core mantle comparison? By knowing the size of Mars, uh, the mass of Mars, we can calculate the average density of Mars. We can see how Mars rotates on its axis. We know it's differentiated into at least a uh, mantle and core. And based on you know, the overall density of Mars and what we know in terms of the density of rocks at the Mars surface, uh, we can again put some constraints on, well, how big can, what proportion of Mars is core versus mantle? Okay, but the better, uh, I mean, the way we get a more refined analysis of what's going on in the 
structure of the interior of the Earth is through analyzing earthquake data. So this seismic anal analysis. So we have literally tens of thousands of uh, earthquake monitoring stations around the globe and they're collecting uh, data regularly on earthquake activity that they measure at these different places and so when we have large earthquakes take place we can triangulate where those earthquakes are coming from based on when the signals arrive at different stations and we'll actually have a lab activity um, where you'll get the chance to analyze some real seismic data to, to do that kind of earthquake location but um, the point for today's lecture is that the passage of those earthquake uh, waves through the earth give us a probe that allow us to actually uh, infer what's going on with different layers of different densities in, uh, and um, at different depths in the earth. Okay, so earthquakes, when we do get um, a release of energy at, say, a plate boundary uh, coming in a, in a shock of an earthquake, that's going to generate these energy waves that are going to be transiting through the earth in different ways. And um, those waves are just... Um, like I say, propagation of energy uh, through this medium. Okay. You think about waves, uh, um, surface waves that are going across a lake. Basically, the lake water is not moving itself, but the energy that is is bound up in that lake in that wave is is passing across. So. Um, We'll look at different ways that uh, seismic waves can move through rock in just a minute, but um, all while the rock itself is moving back and forth or up and down or side to side, the, uh, it's the energy that's basically being transmitted through the material. Um, it's not like this earthquake, this seismic wave is moving material from the beginning, from where the earthquake occurred to the seismic station itself. It's the energy that is transferring through the substrate. We're mostly, as the general public, in, interested in the surface waves from earthquakes because these are what do the damage. Um, these tend to be the, the high amplitude movement of the Earth's surface that's going to be knocking buildings down and breaking pipelines and causing freeway uh, you know, overpasses to collapse and so forth. Uh, as, uh, as the surface waves move through, you get land surfaces undulating up and down, you get uh, land surfaces moving you know, from side to side. Um, and that's really going to be what is causing the damage. But this is not really the most informative information. That's awkward. Uh, this is not the most informative, informative source of, of data about what's going on inside the Earth, these, these surface waves. What's more interesting to us are the, the waves that move through the rock itself. And we have two basic kinds of, um, of body waves that move below the surface in terms of these elastic um, movements. The P wave is a, um, is a wave of energy that is expressed through compression and, uh, and stretching of the rock substrate that the energy is moving through. 
So I don't have any good physical models with me here. Um, if you imagine that initial shock of the earthquake pushing on the surrounding rock, that's going to temporarily compress the rock that's right adjacent to the uh, release of that energy. That compression is going to in turn compress rock further away and at the same time that initial uh, compressed rock will be able to expand back out again. So the P wave kind of moves through is this compression uh, and stretching of the material as the, as the material goes straight through. Brandon? Couldn't you kind of think of it like a slinky versus a piece of rope? Uh, well, yeah, if you do think of it as a slinky, um, you can do both of these with a slinky, actually. If you had a slinky kind of moderately stretched out, and you took the end of the slinky and you moved it in and out, that's going to lead to these kind of compression expansion waves that are going to go through the slinky. You take the same slinky and you can uh, swing it back and forth on the one end like a rope and that would be more like the, the secondary or the S waves. Okay. Again these are all going through the solid rock. These are not the surface waves, those come later. And. Um, each of these types of wave phenomenon are going to have their own velocity at which they're moving either through the rock or along the surface of, uh, of the earth. And we can use that um, timing information to basically um, look inside the earth to see what's going on. So we can do some experimental work where we set off, say for example, this controlled explosion um, some kilometers away from a seismic station. And if you look at the recording at the seismic station in response to that explosion, you'll see first to arrive is, will be this P wave second to arrive will be the S wave and then the third to arrive would be the surface wave which in general is going to be larger in amplitude than the other two. So which of these types of waves moves the fastest? P wave. Okay. So that compression, that just direct pushing and having that pushing move through the rock is what travels the fastest. The um, S wave, the lateral displacement of rock underneath the ground is going to be a little bit slower but still faster than the surface wave that's going along the surface. Okay. So based on, it, on um, you know, studies like this, we can come up with average velocities for these different kinds of waves. And therefore, if we knew how far away an earthquake was from the recording station, we would know when we would expect these P waves, S waves, and surface waves to show up. Okay. So, you know, here's just kind of a more uh, reasonable example. We have the uh, earthquake occurring down here. We identify the surface of the earth above the earthquake as uh, the location of the epicenter. We have a seismic station some distance away, which is normally measured in terms of this angular distance. And then uh, clearly surface wave is going to travel along obviously the surface. And we expect that the body waves, the SP and S waves, would be able to just propagate through the rock, right? So the shortest distance between the epicenter and the seismic station is going to be this kind of straight line. Okay. So if you had a um, seismic station, if you had three seismic stations, One, two, 
one, two, and three here. And two was twice as far away from the earthquake as one. And it took, say, um, I don't know, five minutes for the P wave to show up at station one. How long would you expect it to take for that P wave to show up at station two? Mm -hmm. Ten minutes. Okay. That would be your expectation. But it's not. So based on just those data and distances from the earthquake, we would expect that S waves would have a travel time corresponding to this function, and P waves would have a travel time corresponding to this function. P waves are faster, therefore you would expect a lower travel time than the S waves. But what we see is not these straight lines, but uh, the P waves, for example, are actually showing up more quickly than we would expect just based on how far away the earthquake is. Yeah, Brandon. So they accelerate? I was going to ask, how do you interpret this? If the P waves are showing up quicker than we would expect based on what we measure from the short distance tests, what does that tell you about the P waves as they're actually traveling through the Earth? Are they traveling slower or faster than expected? Faster. Okay. So there's something about going through the Earth for longer distances as opposed to those short distances where we are you know, getting our initial data that result in the P wave moving even faster. And same thing for the S waves. So there's something about going through the Earth that is speeding up the velocity of both of those waves. And the more Earth they're going through, the more they get sped up. Um, there's a couple of other things on this diagram here. I mean, if you go far enough away, if your recording station is far enough away from the earthquake, you all of a sudden don't see S waves anymore. It's not like they just kind of slowly peter out. It's, you might have a massive earthquake, and the, this recording station here, you see a very pronounced S wave, but this one over here, the S wave is just gone. So that's another clue as to what is going on inside the earth. Same thing happens with the P waves. You get to a certain, you get to that same point, and they all of a sudden just disappear, but they later show up again. Yeah, you get far enough away, you start seeing the P waves again. But no matter how far away you get, um, you never start, you never see the, the S waves show up again. So that's obviously a clue. Something different is happening between the P waves and the S waves. And then you also get these weird kind of weak P wave arrivals that we'll talk about in a minute. So we do know that conditions in the Earth will influence how fast these waves move. And I don't want to go into this in great detail, but we can, uh, we can ex take rocks of different compositions and we can expose them to high pressures and temperatures and um, measure how rapidly different kinds of waves propagate through them and we, we see that temperature has an effect, pressure has an effect um, and we also can tell that uh, these waves of energy can be bent and reflected when they hit different areas of different uh, densities. Okay? So changing in density changes the velocity at which these uh, waves of energy are moving through the Earth, can change their direction, it can reflect them back up, it can uh, cause them to bend. And um, so what we're gonna talk about on Tuesday, when we pick this back up again, 
is how to actually use this data from the earthquake stations to essentially image what's going on with the different layers inside uh, the Earth. Okay, so then to resume, uh, this diagram kind of uh, summarizes all of those, uh, those factors with the different velocities uh, and how that reflects the densities and, and, and uh, interactions of these waves at, um, um, at different depths of the Earth. So essentially what is going on when we have, say, an earthquake here, that's going to generate these seismic waves. They tend to um, follow these arced paths through the Earth. Because of that uh, reflection and refraction and differences in velocities that we were talking about, um, if, you're, if the earthquake is here and your seismic station is here, those waves are actually not taking a straight path through the um, through the different layers of the Earth. Okay. So they're actually traveling farther than we would expect, but they're still showing up sooner than we predict, which means that these velocities down here, where the materials are denser, have to be significantly faster than the velocities we measure when we're measuring right at the surface of the Earth. Okay. So let's walk through what happens when we have an actual earthquake at some location. I'm going to switch over to red. So we've got a massive earthquake here. And let's say we had a recording station here at 30 degrees angular distance from that earthquake. What's going to show up first? and the seismic trays recording that earthquake. Which of the three waves travels the fastest? P wave. P wave, okay, so the P wave is gonna show up first, and then S. S, and then finally, the surface. Okay, so P, S, surface. So basically the, the S, the P and S waves are gonna be arcing down through the earth, the surface wave is going to be coming across the top. And if this is a big earthquake, we would expect to see a very large P wave, a very large S wave when we are here at 30 degrees away. Okay. So big, big waves because we've got a big earthquake we're talking about. Uh, if we're at 60 degrees away from the earthquake and we're recording, again, what wave is going to show up first? P, second, third, surface. How does the, the delay time for the P wave at 60 degrees away from the earthquake compare to the delay time for the P wave at 30 degrees? Where is the P wave going to show up first? Here at 30 degrees or here at 60 degrees? 30, okay. So, um, if we kind of drew this, we'd have a big P wave, a big S wave, and then a humongous surface wave for station one. For station two, we would see a delay, and the P wave is going to be bigger or smaller than the P wave at station one? It's going to be a little bit smaller. It's traveling further, the energy is dissipated. The S wave is going to again be delayed compared to station one one and a little bit smaller, and the surface waves, again, are going to be a little bit smaller. If we go to 90 degrees, you know, we would expect the same kind of thing. What happens, though, for both the P and the S waves is that when you get to 98 degrees, well, let's say 99 degrees, here at 100 degrees, all of a sudden, you see that. It's not like the waves have just kind of petered out. If you were at 96 degrees, you would see, you know, boom, 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 and then this. 
And you go a few degrees further around, you get nothing. So what is that? How do you interpret that? Remember these waves are having to go down deeper and deeper as they're going to these different stations. Ellie. Um, the waves can't travel through the core. There's something in here that these waves can't travel through. So they get to that something and then they're either reflected off or refracted, but they don't, they're not you know, following a nice smooth. Okay. So let's take a look at the S waves and the P waves separately. Basically the way the S waves have been interpreted is that um, they essentially can't propagate through the core at all. Remember the S waves are internal waves, but they're not the compression waves that are going back and forth. They're actual physical displacement up and down side to side. And there's something about the density difference at this boundary that just stops them cold. So if you've got an earthquake here, you would expect to see S waves showing up at all these seismic stations until you get so far away that the S waves would have to travel through the core, even the outer core, and then that stops them. So all of this region is going to be in the shadow of the core in terms of S waves. So hopefully you can see just from basic geometry, if you kind of know how much these, these waves arc as they're traveling through the different layers, just on a kind of basic geometry, you could get a base, an idea of what the outer margin of the, inner, of the outer core versus mantle boundary is at. Brandon. And the inverse of that graphic would be true for something happening in the southern Right, so if we were had, actually had the uh, earthquake here, basically the shadow would be in this region. Okay. So this is, I mean, at, if you say zero degrees here, that could be at any point on the globe. And that's why these, uh, these uh, distances are measured in, in angular displacement. You know, you could be in, um, in Uruguay, where the earthquake is, and basically um, draw a circle around the globe that are all of the points on the surface that are 98 degrees away from that epicenter of the earthquake. Anything beyond that, north, south, east, west, is going to be in shadow in terms of the S waves. Okay. So, remember the S waves are this kind of actual physical displacement of materials. And um, we're kind of jumping ahead a bit, but we know now and from you know, other data that we're talking about a liquid metal outer core as opposed to a solid metal inner core. And those S waves basically are just stopped by the liquid nature of the outer core. Okay. So the situation is more complicated for the P waves, so let's switch over to those. The P waves again are that compression wave, so that push and pull back of the material in response to the release of energy at the earthquake. That kind of uh, inter-seismic wave can go through the liquid core, but because of the density variations between the boundary of the mantle and the core, and the inner core and the outer core, um, and especially um, the boundary between the outer core and the mantle, those differences in density refract the waves, change their direction, and so again, we see kind of a rough shadow happening 
at the same point where the S waves go into shadow. But now we've got, um, we have the ability for these P waves to bounce around and actually show up on the opposite side of the Earth as direct P waves that um, have basically traveled through the mantle in the outer core and perhaps the inner core uh, to get to stations on the other side of the Earth. And then we see these kind of, sh of uh, partial P waves that reflect um, you know, a, a refracted pathway of the P wave at the mantle outer core boundary and then a reflection off of the inner core to uh, kind of create an echo, a P wave echo. So if you put all this together, um, it makes some assumptions on how arced these pathways are in response to changes in density as you go through um, the different parts of the mantle, outer core, and inner core. You can come up with fairly good uh, estimates of the size of the inner core and the outer core where these boundaries are just based on the geometry of the system to get these waves to bounce around to get to the recording stations that you're collecting from. You have to remember we've got tens of thousands of seismic stations and we have earthquakes going on all the time so this is, you know, this is really big data that uh, you can analyze to, to come up with um, with this picture that we're looking at here. Okay. So, um, based on these analyses and laboratory studies of the you know, behavior of materials under different temperatures and pressures and the idea that we're gonna have um, iron and nickel and cobalt and other metals that are heavy, you know, naturally collecting at the, at the core of the earth, that um, we've got essentially the idea of a solid inner core, a liquid outer core, and those are both more dense than the mantle, and it's those density differences that bounce the seismic waves around the, the way that we see them bounce around. So, um, let me just ask you, do you expect the inner core to be hotter or cooler than the outer core? How many say that the inner core should probably be cooler than the outer core? How many say the inner core should probably be hotter than the outer core? Why, why hotter? Okay. So yeah, generally speaking, temperatures do increase the further down we go into the Earth. Okay. So if the inner core is hotter than the outer core, why is it solid when the outer core is liquid? It's made of different material. It has a different uh, melting point. Pretty much the same material. It's it's iron, cobalt, nickel. Even the pressure. Pressure. Okay. So even though it's hotter in the inner core, the pressures are even so much greater that that causes the inner core to be solid even in spite of the higher temperatures. I don't think I'm going to unpack these uh, in great detail based on, you know, just we need to get on with things. but. Uh, the picture we talked about is a pretty simplistic analysis of the tons and tons of data we've got from looking at seismic recordings. And if you, you know, pour into those data in more detail, you can obviously pull out more fine detail about the structure of the interior layers of the Earth. Uh, in particular, we're concerned about, um, you know, We've kind of talked about the boundary between the uh, inner core and outer core and the boundary between the outer core and the mantle. We can also use these seismic data to get an idea of how far down the crust goes. 
And um, I think we've mentioned this before, but the crust is shallower under the uh, ocean. Uh, so for oceanic plates, the, the crust is shallower. And beneath continents, the crust is thicker. Uh, so continental masses not only stick up above the ocean basin, but they also extend down further into the mantle. They ride lower in the mantle than the oceanic crusts. And we'll talk about that um, later when we talk, well, we'll talk about that later. Uh, but, you know, with all this data, we can define um, more, more finely how densities and velocities, how densities of the material and velocities of the seismic wave vary at all of these different layers. Uh, I think the only thing I really want to focus on is, you know, we can take a much finer look at what's going on between the crust and the mantle. And the crust is, in this diagram, just this uh, very thin layer in gray. We had a question earlier about what's the lithosphere. Is the, lithos is the lithosphere the same as the crust? Uh, the lithosphere is actually the crust and the uppermost layer of the mantle that this layer essentially acts as the hard candy coating on the, on the tree here. Uh, so the plates that we've talked about about being broken up and shifting around are, you know, broken up pieces of the lithosphere that would include crust and upper part of the mantle. And then right below that is this asthenosphere, which is the most uh, liquidy, gooey part of the mantle. So if we go with, uh, with candy metaphors again, we've got the, the crunchy outer crust here. We've got the uh, gooey caramel part. And then I guess this inside would be, you know, what's the, the nougat bar or whatever uh, that's crunchy and solid. Okay. Yeah, it's just more of the same. So, um, you yeah, know, you can look at the slide in more detail once I put the material up online, but uh, we've got basically to think about what's going on with continental and oceanic crust, what's happening in the mantle, and then we've got the core underneath, um, and these are, you know, kind of rough ideas about what we're talking about. So, uh, you know, you can look at this quantitatively to show how, you know, even the 25 to 85 kilometers for the continental crust um, is a small, small fraction of the total uh, radius of the Earth. Okay. So... Uh, again, the point is, none of us have visited the center of the Earth, and um, we still, through uh, you know, making the observations we can make in the lab and in the field, and interpreting those, do a pretty good job of figuring out what's going on inside the Earth. So, what I want to do for a quick little um, in-class writing is there are still people who seriously believe in hollow earth theory and um, the conspiracies to keep the truth from the people uh, in regarding around this. So I would like you to all take out a piece of paper and just do a little narrative writing if you were trying to I don't know if I want to say convince, because if you're talking to a conspiracy theory, theorist, it's difficult to convince. But, I mean, what arguments would you lay out, and how would you lay them out to someone who was a proponent of this hollow earth theory to say, no, um, you know, we actually know that that's not the case? <laughs> 